At 8 years of age, Ronaldinho got back home after spending the day playing football to find everyone crying. His brother, Roberto, who was starting his own career as a professional footballer, would take him to the other room and tell him that his father had passed away. They had just moved to a big house with a pool with the money from Roberto's first big contract, trying to get Ronaldinho away from the crime-filled streets Roberto had grown up in. But unfortunately, it was in that very pool that their father drowned after suffering a heart attack only a few days after moving to their new house. From that moment on, Roberto became like a father to Ronaldinho. However, even if he did have the best of intentions, Ronaldinho's blind trust in him would eventually prove fatal. He would grow up in a bubble, kept from the outside world, developing no sense of responsibility, which eventually would not only be his demise on the pitch, but would leave him completely afloat, with his brother at the wheel, soon landing them both in jail after going through every white-collar crime in the book, from Ponzi schemes to money laundering, tax evasion, forging documents, and even an environmental lawsuit. Being brought up in a football family, Ronaldinho played football all day and when no one wanted to play with him anymore, he would go on and play with his dog instead. They even say he perfected his elasticos trying to get the ball in between the dog's legs. Coming from a family like that and with every one of his relatives claiming he was the best of the bunch, he quickly became a local star and it only escalated when at 13 years of age he hit the news after scoring 23 goals for his youth team in a single match. Even more absurd considering they say they had won it 23 nil. It would all start when Brazil won the Under-17 World Cup. After that tournament, everyone could see Ronaldinho would be the next great, and the fact he shared his name with Ronaldo Nazario only made it even more interesting. Thanks to the success at the tournament, he earned his first few matches for Grêmio, hitting the headlines again after scoring the winning goal in embarrassing Brazilian legend Dunga twice in the final of the Gaúcho Championship, with both clips being replayed over and over all across Brazilian television. However, by then, his brother Roberto would not be playing for Grêmio anymore. A knee injury had left his career on the tightrope and before he fell, he decided to cash out with a move to Europe. Over the span of just a few months, Ronaldinho's fame had gone through the roof and it had earned him a place at the 1999 Copa America. With Brazil taking the trophy and Ronaldinho impressing everyone despite being mostly used as a sub, once again he would use this tournament as a stepping stone as it allowed him the playing time he deserved just a week later as Brazil qualified for the Confederations Cup where Ronaldinho would deliver his first world-class performance, scoring six goals across the five matches, winning the player of the tournament and top scorer awards even though Brazil would lose the final to Mexico. Over the next year, he would keep pushing more and more and with a stellar record of 14 goals in 21 league matches with Grêmio, he would earn his first big move, joining PSG on a free transfer, plotted by his brother who had now become his agent as well. However, it would leave people back at his hometown with a sour taste in their mouths as they felt they should have made sure that Grammy would get some of the money for the player. In fact, his brother even found himself a move to France as well, playing for Montpellier in order to stay beside him and soon he would even retire altogether at 31 years of age because he felt he was doing more good by Ronaldinho's side than on the pitch. At PSG, he would get his first taste of European football, joining some other stars like Anelka, Okocha and even Pochettino. Still, he struggled to adapt at first, being mostly used as a bench player, though he did manage to rack up some goals despite getting into a confrontation with the coach, who insisted he had gotten caught up in the city's nightlife, saying he did not even care for football anymore. But regardless of what was happening in Paris, in Brazil he had established himself as a starter, getting his first ever shot at playing the World Cup, and man, he was incredible incredible from the get-go. If there's one word to describe Ronaldinho, it would be iconic, for sure, and that's exactly what those performances were. Right from the group stage, he put on a show, scoring and assisting in the 45 minutes he got to play against China. Then, after one more assist against Belgium, he went on to play one of the most memorable matches of his career. Brazil had played 45 minutes against England and were behind 1-0 and then, in just 12 minutes, Ronaldinho floated right through the middle of the pitch and supplied Rivaldo with an assist, scored the 40-yard free kick that is considered one of the all-time greatest goals and then got a red card. Still, Brazil went through and went on to win the World Cup, making him a world champion at 22 years of age, but those 12 minutes, they gave us a taste of what his career would be like, a frenetic roller coaster of ups and downs like no other. 
It's easy to point out that regardless of his troubles, his career so far was an unprecedented success. At 22, he had already lifted the three major international trophies, but maybe that was why his downfall started so early. Some could argue he had already completed football, that there was not much else to fight for, and that might just be why we didn't get to see him at his peak for very long. In his second season at PSG, things began getting even worse. Sure, Ronaldinho did score the goal of the season and he got himself a standing ovation in the cup final, but well, they lost that final and PSG finished in the bottom half of the league table. Ronaldinho had a toxic relationship with the club and its staff. It wasn't working out for either of them, so they began plotting a way for him to leave the club. But before that, he went on to leave one final disappointment as Brazil would be knocked out of the Confederations Cup in the group stage, shocking everyone. Still, the race for his signing did not lose any traction whatsoever. Barcelona's president had promised the fans he would sign one of Beckham, Henri and Ronaldinho. And with Beckham signing for Real and Arsenal not budging for Henri, Ronaldinho was the obvious answer, with Barcelona letting go of 30 million euros for the 23-year-old. Some could argue that between the three, signing Ronaldinho was a bit of a cop-out, as he didn't post the same star power as the other two at the time, but the moment he put on the Blaugrana shirt, everything changed. It seemed destined to be, he dazzled the entire world, always something special with every touch of the ball, and those are not my words, but actually something Frank Riker said right after his debut. With 8 goals and 4 assists in his first 14 matches, it was an incredible start, but then problems with his Achilles tendon left him out for one month and his absence caused enough of a dent in Barcelona's form for them to drop down all the way to 12th place. But though right now that might seem absurd, back then Barcelona had not won the league in 5 years and they hadn't won at the Bernabeu for 7. Times were pretty rough and with a string of results like that, Ronaldinho would have a really tough task trying to fix up their season once he was back. But in reality, once he did come back it seemed effortless. He picked them back up instantly, averaging a goal contribution every 110 minutes throughout the rest of the season, helping them finally get that long-awaited win at the Bernabeu and leaving them just 5 points short of the title. They might have finished second, but back then, it felt like a win. Even the great Xavi Hernandez would go on to say that Ronaldinho had started the rise of Barcelona. In the following season, things only got more incredible. Now with Samuel Eto'o and Deco by his side, Ronaldinho would completely take over the league. By the time New Year's came around, Barcelona were 10 points ahead of second place already and the world was on its knees. Everyone could see Ronaldinho with magic like no one else really. In only a bit more than one year, he had gone from troubled wonder kid to all-out legendary status, one of the greatest of all time and so he had to be rewarded, being named the FIFA Player of the Year. Regardless, then things didn't really go according to plan. Barcelona did win the league after 6 years, but being knocked out in the last 16 of the Champions League by Chelsea left everyone feeling like it had all ended too soon, especially for Ronaldinho who had scored twice against them and had put on a legendary performance, especially remembered for his toe poke goal from outside the box. To make up for that disappointment, he would go on to win the Confederations Cup over summer, being named the man of the match in the final and scoring in all of the three final matches which added to his goals in 1999 made him already the competition's all-time top scorer. As the third season at Barcelona started, he hit some of the best goal-scoring form of his career, with 13 goals in 12 matches at one point, even scoring twice at the Bernabeu in a match that saw the Madrid fans give him a standing ovation. They don't do that, like, at all. Ever. I doubt some perspective is needed, but if it is, let's just say the only player to have ever managed that was Diego Maradona. As you might imagine, these achievements eventually earned him the second consecutive FIFA Player of the Year and the crown jewel of his career, the Ballon d'Or. And this time around, he 100% managed to keep his form over the second half of the season and especially in the Champions League, scoring the decisive goal against Chelsea in the last 16 before also scoring in the quarterfinals and then assisting the only goal of the semi-final matches against AC Milan. Ronaldinho had scored or assisted against every team he faced in the Champions League that season for a total of 7 goals and 4 assists in 11 matches. In the final, things took a different path with 
Valletti being the unlikely hero as Ronaldinho finally stayed off of the score sheet and Barcelona finally won the Champions League for the second time in their history after 14 years. With performances like these, he would easily win the third consecutive UEFA Player of the Year award which goes to show how much of a big game player he was. And then, to top off the season, they beat Real to the league title by a staggering 12 points. Going into the 2006 World Cup, it just seemed like it would be Ronaldinho's tournament, the one to settle him as a contender for the title of the greatest of all time, but then Brazil would actually look more like a team who was conforming. I guess they had had enough success and they just didn't seem as hungry anymore. The whole national team kind of reflected the sort of state of mind that many would see in Ronaldinho over the following years. In fact, one of his first highly publicized scandals came right after they were knocked out by France while only managing a single shot on target. Really think about that. Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, Adriano, Rubinho and Kaká and only one shot on target? To make it all 10 times worse than Ronaldinho would join Adriano in what seemed like a quest to prove the critics right, throwing a huge party in Brazil only days after disappointing the entire nation. They were so upset at them that they went to the streets to protest and even burned the statue of the man himself down to a crisp. It's hard not to see that statue burning down as a metaphor, because it would represent a massive turning point in Ronaldinho's career, as it was around that time that he did indeed seem to burn out. That endless joy he provided quickly turned into mere glimpses of his brilliance that more than often were just outshined by his antics and shady business off the pitch, though, as you will see, that might not have been entirely his fault. In reality, the first half also really explains what happened next, because after a season where he didn't even break the 10-goal barrier and Barcelona finished trophyless, leading Rijkaard to be sacked, Guardiola arrived and quickly told him and Deco that he wanted them out of the club, because he felt they would be bad influences on a young Lionel Messi. At the time, the board tried to make it all seem less severe, claiming they felt a move away from Barcelona would be beneficial to both parties and that Ronaldinho only needed a new challenge, but eventually, with his move to AC Milan, the truth started coming out. Ronaldinho claimed he never wanted to leave as he was excited to watch his partnership with Messi develop more and more and the board would eventually be quoted, admitting that they were convinced Ronaldinho was past his prime and would never get back to where he used to be. And honestly, that wasn't really news to anyone. Ever since 2007, newspapers and fans had been poking fun at Ronaldinho for his weight. As his move began to materialize, there were even jokes that AC Milan was replacing the fat Ronaldo for the fat Ronaldinho, calling the club a retirement home and you know how it goes. They even say AC Milan didn't want to sign him, they only did it because Ronaldinho's brother kept pestering them about it and because they wanted to keep a good relationship with him as they were in the process of expanding their scouting network to Brazil and somehow his brother was actually a key figure in that plan. He would find an AC Milan in the process of rebuilding. The players who were left from their success at the start of the century were now heading towards retirement, such as Maldini, Nesta, Gattuso, Inzaghi and Shevchenko. Still, there were some young prospects in the team like Pato and Kaká and also some other legends still eager to give it their best despite their age and that could understand how Ronaldinho felt at this stage of his career, like Pirlo and Beckham. But regardless, that first season he looked kind of hopeless. However, after a managerial change, his second season turned out to be the best glimmer of hope we got, with Ronaldinho managing to finish as the top assist provider in the league with an impressive 18 assists, as well as some iconic performances, including a goal and assist against Man United, as well as a brace against Juventus in the final match day. It was pretty obvious what was motivating him to get back in form though. Ronaldinho wanted to be at his best for the 2010 World Cup and honestly, after a season like that, it's hard to argue that he didn't deserve a spot in the team. However, Dunga, the national team coach, decided not to call him up, which led many fans to start conspiracy theories that he only left him out because... I don't know if you still recall from the start of the video, but Tunga was the player Ronaldinho embarrassed in one of his first ever matches as a teenager, and some believe Dunga was still filled with resentment over that day. However, if you really look at it, you'll see Ronaldo, Rubinho, Adriano and Pato were also left out, and given Dunga's more strict and rigid personality, it seems to me that he was just done with having to handle players who were more interested in partying than playing. 
And honestly, once again, Ronaldinho proved them right. Over this season, he had managed to get in great form, losing all his weight, but once he was told the World Cup would not be a thing for him, he completely let loose. He partied all summer and the tabloids had a field day, snapping pics of his incredibly overweight shape every time he stepped foot on the beach. He had become a laughing stock, to be honest. Even with the arrivals of Ibra and Rubinho, nothing seemed to be enough to convince Ronaldinho to stay and so, he began plotting his next move. There were talks with LA Galaxy where he could join David Beckham again. More impressively, there were rumors that he would be joining Blackburn Rovers who had been bought by an Indian company and were plotting some big moves, also planning to get Beckham on loan, but not only did they fail to secure any of the two players, they ended up getting relegated by the end of the season, which is kind of funny. In the end, Ronaldinho went with a more obvious route and sailed off to Brazil, however, he managed to quickly get on the wrong side of a lot of fans by picking Flamengo to be his next team instead of his childhood club Grêmio. In reality, it had once again been his brother who had incited a bidding war and in the end that convinced him to join Flamengo instead. Regardless, once in Brazil he would actually perform pretty impressively, especially given that his contract with Flamengo literally had a clause that gave the player the right to party at nightclubs two times a week, regardless of the training schedule. Still, not even that was enough to keep him at the club as the following season they would go on four months without paying him, leading Ronaldinho to cancel his contract with the club and move on, joining Atlético Mineiro just four days later where he started playing even better, scoring 10 and assisting 15 in the league, helping Mineiro qualify for the Copa Libertadores and winning the league's Player of the Season award. This period of good form continued on to the following season. They believed in Ronaldinho so much that he was often completely rested in the league so that he could go all out in the Copa Libertadores and the final result was incredible. Ronaldinho ended up providing them with 4 goals and 7 assists across the competition's 14 matches, leading them to their first ever Copa Libertadores title, only made more impressive by the fact they performed a 2-goal comeback in both the final and semi-final, with Ronaldinho winning the award for South America's Player of the Year, as well as a place in the Brazilian national team once again. However, in classic Ronaldinho fashion, success had to be followed by some dark times and so, before the end of the season he got injured, went three months without playing and eventually quit Atlético Mineiro after playing half a season and winning the Recopa Sudamericana. Once he became a free agent again, everyone was trying to get their peace, even basing Stoke Town in the 6th division of English football sent him a proposal, however, Ronaldinho ended up in Mexico, where he actually took his team Queretaro to the final of the playoffs, nearly being champions for the first time in their history. One year later, a return to Brazil saw him join Fluminense which was honestly just depressing, with Ronaldinho being heavily criticized for his poor performances by the fans, being so humiliated that after just two months with the club, he cut his 15-month contract short, entering what looked like retirement, even though he would only come to terms with it after some years playing futsal in India, announcing it in 2018 which just happened to be the year when things began getting truly out of pocket, with his lawyer eventually saying He's an idiot. He was kept in a bubble since he was 14, his brother takes care of everything and he just goes along. Which can sound really harsh, but knowing that it is his brother who takes care of every business he is involved in and considering everything that would go on to happen is actually really worrying and kind of dark. Just listen. At the start of 2018, it came out that Ronaldinho had married two women at the same time in a ceremony held at his mansion. People were shocked, but they weren't exactly surprised. Regardless, he came out saying it wasn't true and all of that, but once he broke up with one of the girls, not only did she sue him, trying to get her share of his fortune, but her mother actually went on TV explaining their relationship, saying he had two bedrooms, one for each one of the girls, and that they weren't in a three-way relationship. It was more like Ronaldinho being in two relationships at the same time, one day with one, the other day with the other. However, their relationship had come to an end because she found out that he had a mistress. I guess two girls just wasn't enough. 
Still, that year would get even more absurd, first with Barcelona cutting all ties with Ronaldinho due to his support of controversial Brazilian president Bolsonaro, which by the way, almost led Ronaldinho to run for Senate, and then he and his brother were prosecuted by the government for tearing down part of a forest without any permits, with the police raiding his houses, confiscating everything from his car collection to paintings, jewels and his passports. But then, to the shock of many, and probably his ex-wife as well, they would also confiscate his bank accounts in an attempt to pay environmental damage fines and unpaid taxes of upwards of $2 million, only to find out that he had a mere $5 across all of his accounts, leading the media to report that he was broke when, in fact, the money was probably just somewhere else. After all, he had a million different kinds of businesses running at the same time, and every one of them shadier than the one before it. Just so you get an idea, that same year he was involved in a cryptocurrency pump and dump scheme with a coin literally being named after him, though to be fair once again it seemed he had no idea what was going on. With more tax evasion and another environmental lawsuit after he built a fishing deck over a protected river, the police then proceeded to seize 57 properties belonging to the player and his brother, suspending their passports, which prompted Roberto to get fake ones so they could enter Paraguay for what was, to the knowledge of Ronaldinho, only a promotional event for his book. Obviously, they ended up being caught. I mean, it's Ronaldinho, what were they expecting? Of course they noticed the passport was fake. Regardless, this led both of them to be in prison, but at least Ronaldinho made the most out of his time there, taking part in a futsal tournament inside the jail where of course his team won, supposedly winning the final 11-2 with Ronaldinho scoring 5 and assisting the other 6. But once again, it seems he didn't even realize the extent of the mess he was involved in. Why would you be playing football when you're locked away in a foreign country with your life at risk? Still, their appeal went through and they were moved to house arrest at an hotel after paying $1.6 million in bail, as well as another $160,000 in fines that would eventually set them free. His lawyer would go on to explain the situation, saying, I truly believe that he had no idea what he was doing. He just thought the passports were a gift. You have to understand this. He isn't the smartest of guys. Which, once again, is honestly just kind of dark, especially now that 14 more people have been jailed as the case has been revealed to have ties to a money laundering scheme which, of course, Ronaldinho knew nothing about. What do you think? Is his brother just taking advantage of him? Because sometimes it really seemed like he was just taking care of him, but now it's all getting very hard to justify.